Good morning from New York City and welcome to our Bloomberg panel discussion on securing Wall Street from cyber risks. I'm Eric Schatzker, an editor at large at Bloomberg Television, and it's great to see you. Our distinguished and accomplished panelists today are two of the official the officials, excuse me, most responsible for protecting this country from cyber attacks. Eric Goldstein is the assistant, excuse me, executive assistant director for cybersecurity at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency inside the Department of Homeland Security. He studied law and public policy in grad school at Georgetown, worked for a precursor to CISA, then oversaw cybersecurity at Goldman Sachs before returning to government in his current role in February of 2021. Executive Assistant Director Goldstein, welcome. Thank you, great to be here. And Brian Vordren is Assistant Director of the FBI's Cyber Division. He's an engineer who earned his MBA at the University of Michigan uh, and then worked for Procter & Gamble and Merck before joining the Bureau in 2003. Over the past decade, his responsibilities have ranged from strategic operations for FBI counterterrorism to dismantling multinational criminal gangs. He was appointed to his current role in March of 2021. Assistant Director Vordren, welcome to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. There's a great deal of interest in this panel. Gentlemen, to keep things easy and flowing along nicely, uh, from here on, I'm going to address you by your first names. Eric and Brian. And to the audience, before we begin, a couple of notes. Um, to, we, we do have three polls we'd like you to participate in, so be sure to pay attention and respond when I prompt you. The choices, of course, will come up on your screen. And if you have questions, submit them using the Q&A widget you'll find on the console, on the side of the console, and I will do my best to work them in. Uh, if something should go wrong, you know what to do, refresh the browser and hope for the best. Uh, let's get started. Uh, Eric and Brian, uh, just by way of preamble, your agencies are obviously both parts of the same government. They work closely together on cybersecurity and cybercrime, and ultimately they share many of the same objectives. But, and it's an important but, there are differences that are highly relevant to the conversation we're about to have. And so I think it would be useful if we started by having you, Eric, as assistant, uh, executive assistant director, briefly frame how CISA approaches the problem of cyber attacks on Wall Street, and then having you, Brian, as assistant director of the FBI, um, explain the way you think about it and the Bureau's approach. So Eric, why don't you begin by framing the problem and how you look at it? Of course, thanks so much, Eric. You know, at CISA, we really have a single-minded focus of helping every organization in this country, particularly including our critical infrastructure, like the financial sector, understand evolving cybersecurity risks and then implement the mitigations that are known to be effective in reducing the likelihood and impact of a cybersecurity intrusion. And of course, if an incident does occur, helping organizations respond and recover, and then rapidly sharing information to help protect other potential victims. And so in this way, we are really a victim-focused organization helping to protect against and prevent intrusions and reduce impacts when they do occur. In that mission, we work extraordinarily closely with our core partners, uh, including, and of course, the FBI, as well as the owners and operators of private networks themselves, who of course are accountable in the first instance to actually deploy security controls and mitigations across their networks. Because at the end of the day, cybersecurity is inherently a partnership. And our role here is to support and enable better network defense, but we can only do that if we work in concert with our partners at the FBI who are focused on the threat actors themselves and with network defenders across the country who are actually the ones on the ground deploying protections to make sure that we understand the threats that are manifesting and can take actions in response. Brian? Sure, thanks for the question, Eric. You know, I think to echo some of what Eric Goldstein said, uh, we have a tremendously diverse and decentralized workforce in the FBI. We can arguably put an FBI agent and on any doorstep in this country within an hour and probably in 70 countries within about a day. But that victim focus uh, permeates the FBI's ecosystem as well when we look at cyber. 
But what differentiates us from CISA is simply that we are focused on the response and investigative side, whereas Eric described their focus on the response and mitigation net defense side. But the tandem partnership between us and CISA and collectively with our private sector partners really forms that three-legged stool of effectiveness for investigation on the threat response side and net defense on the asset response side. You know, in the FBI, we view ourselves as sometimes the action arm and sometimes an enabler, an enabler to our IC partners, but sometimes an action arm for indictments or arrests or extraditions, or, um, you know, to work with private sector partners to flow intelligence back from them to our partners in the IC or to CISA as well. But it really is a team sport. Um, I think that's something you will hear repeatedly from Eric and myself today, is that we're all in this together and private sector's partnership with us is absolutely paramount because they probably see 95% of the threats that we face. Uh, Brian, you just described the FBI's organizational structure as being diffuse. And it sounds to me that by comparison, CISA is more centralized. Is it also helpful to think of the FBI as being, being threat focused, let's say, and CISA being more threat agnostic? You know, Eric, I'll let uh, Eric Goldstein speak for CISA, but from the FBI's perspective, we are certainly threat focused. Uh, we are looking at multiple criminal threats, whether that's ransomware, botnets, banking trojans, third party services, telephone, smartphone applications that contain malware. But then obviously the big nation states of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, uh, the indicators of compromise and the TTPs of all those threats are specific and certainly inform CIS's activity on the net defense side. So if it's okay with you, I'll let Eric Goldstein uh, round out that part of the question. Great, thanks, Brian. You know, I'd say at CISA, we are absolutely threat informed. And what I mean by that is if you look at the sort of cybersecurity practices that are generalizable across threats, if you're deploying multi-factor authentication, if you're adopting zero trust principles where you're locking down your most sensitive accounts and data and you're segmenting your network so an adversary can't move across it, those are going to be effective against every known cyber adversary. But at the same time, we also know that there are some mitigations, that there are some indicators of compromise, some exploited vulnerabilities that are unique to certain adversaries, be they nation states or cyber criminal groups. And so we also work very closely with our partners in the FBI, elsewhere in government and our international partners to understand what the adversaries that we care most about are doing so we can drive prioritized adoption of those mitigations and controls that are most effective against the adversaries that are most likely to compromise American networks and cause harm. A key message that you've both, both excuse me, stressed repeatedly is the need for more cooperation between the public and private sectors on cyber risks. And the implication, it goes without saying, is that you're not getting enough, not getting as much as you want. And Eric, you have worked on both sides, as I explained before. Uh, on the in the public sector, you've worked in the private sector. Why is this the case? Why would Wall Street, in this example that we're taking on today, be hesitant to cooperate with the government on safeguarding threats that everyone recognizes are critical? I think the framing here needs to be that the cybersecurity risk environment overall is extraordinarily challenging. And we are seeing cybersecurity adversaries continue to invest in advanced capabilities, we are of course seeing ransomware actors become increasingly commoditized and these scores of ransomware affecting organizations, public and private across the country and indeed the world. And so with that framing, we need to keep maturing and advancing the public private partnership really every day. You know, this is a, a, a journey of, of ongoing improvement. I think we have seen extraordinary advances in public-private partnership uh, over the years. And the financial sector really has led that model, uh, including, of course, uh, through the Financial Sector Information Sharing and Analysis Council, the FSISAC, as well as other bodies. And so you know, there is certainly extraordinarily robust collaboration ongoing, but that collaboration needs to continuously deepen and evolve as our adversaries evolve as well. Within CISA, we have a fairly new construct called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, or JCDC, that really is the focal point for you know, network defense operations 
uh, for both critical infrastructure as well as the U.S. government. And so we have members from Brian's team at FBI, partners across the government, joining together side by side, operating in virtual environments to collaborate every day around the emergent cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities uh, that we are seeing. And that's just one example of how the partnership model needs to evolve over time. If we say we are good enough, we know the adversaries will keep investing. And so we have to keep maturing so we can actually stay ahead of the threat. Could we talk about the hesitancy for just a moment more? There are executives, I'm aware of some of them, who think that the government is just you know, snooping around, using cybersecurity as a pretext for peering into PII, right? Personally identifiable information or even client data. Yep. The best thing that we can do as the U.S. government to help resolve hesitation with working with us is by showing value, is by showing organizations that by engaging with CISA, engaging with the FBI, that they will get information, expertise, support, the ability to collaborate seamlessly across sectors that helps them protect their enterprise and helps them protect their customers. And so every moment that we can show value, that we have an interaction where a CISO, a CIO at a major corporation can say, you know, they are more secure today because they engage with CISA and our partners, then we've done our job. And that's the most effective thing we can do to resolve hesitations about that sort of collaboration. And Eric, Ryan, if I this, could chime Sure, please go yeah. ahead, jump in. Sure, thank you. You know, to echo some of what Eric Goldstein said, you know, one of the best ways for any organization to um, diffuse those myths would be to build those relationships now, whether that's with the FBI or CISA, as the two primary inject points for domestic intrusions here in the United States. Certainly the FBI has personnel in every city in this country uh, to enable the building of those relationships in real time right now. But that will allow those corporations, those organizations, those academic institutions to talk through all of these issues when the waters are calm, before the storm. So when the storm does arise, everybody is prepared and understands the lanes in the road. I can assure you that there are ways to mitigate all of these concerns. We've done it for many, many years effectively with many different organizations, but those conversations on the front side are absolutely paramount. I was going to say that this issue came up during your congressional testimony, Brian, on ransomware that took place a few months ago. Um, cybercrime victims, right, such as a company that's losing millions of dollars a day while its systems are offline, don't necessarily share or perhaps even care about the FBI's priority, which is catching criminals and preventing them from committing more crimes. Doesn't that create, I mean, Trust in government is a problem enough, but doesn't that create an additional trust gap that's so difficult to close? I guess I have a few thoughts on that question, Eric. You know, the first would be that our position, especially on ransomware attacks in the U.S. government, is that certainly we don't recommend paying the ransom because it just fuels the criminal enterprise and strengthens the adversary. But with that said, we also understand that these are business decisions for every organization out there. In a simple manufacturing environment, we understand that downtime of production line equates to real-time revenue and real-time profits for a corporation. And there's an absolute equation to be drawn out about how much downtime a corporation or a manufacturing entity can really sustain until it's simply worth it for them to pay the ransom. What we would ask of all of these targeted entities or victims is to think a step forward outside of the immediate here and now. And that's the following. If you share with us, there is the potential that we can prevent others from being victimized. We know that's not a mathematical equation that can be solved in the moment, which does again speak to the pre-work and the necess necessity of an incident response plan and exercising that incident response plan. But if we think downstream, the way we get our hands around this as a country and as a team focused on a common purpose is really through that sharing of intelligence and intrusions in real time. And I'll end with this. We estimate within the US government that we have reporting on between 20 and 25% of the total corporate, organizational, academic intrusions here in the country. 
a data set that's 20 to 25% deep will never allow any of us, the government, private sector, our foreign partners, to truly understand the totality of the picture so we can be effective at trying to mitigate it. So just to be clear, if I understand what you just said, you don't have data on 75 to 80% of the intrusions that are taking place. Is that correct? That's our best estimate, yes. I need to take a deep breath for a moment. That's kind of, that's, that's a problem. It's a huge problem, especially as we try to project trends. You know, certainly we can do the best with what we have, um, but we'll never again, just to reiterate, I said, we will never be in a position as a country. It's not about the government. It's not about private sector, but as a country, as a unified team to mitigate this, this threat or to impose cost on our adversaries or to make their way of doing business so complicated that it's not worth it for them anymore. We'll never be infected with 20 to 25% of the data. Gentlemen, I'd like to bring our audience in with the first polling question. And here it is, folks. Uh, please pay attention to your screens. What do you consider your biggest threat to data security? Again, this is a question to our audience. Choice number one, employees sharing data inappropriately or leaking it deliberately. Choice number two, zero day vulnerabilities in your hardware or software. Choice number three, phishing or spear phishing attacks. And choice number four, employees communicating on channels outside of your monitored network. Eric and Brian, I'm going to give the audience an opportunity to answer that question and we'll come back to the poll results in a moment. But in the meantime, I'll put the question to you. You're the experts here. Um, how about we rank order what you consider to be the biggest threats to cybersecurity on Wall Street? Eric, what's at the top of your list? You know, I think if you look at the cybersecurity threats that are affecting every organization, uh, remarkably, phishing and spear phishing still remain uh, you know, the most utilized uh, intrusion vector for many adversaries. And so you know, I think if we look at, at the mitigations uh, and the controls that are most effective in driving down uh, known intrusions, that would absolutely be at the top of my list. I'll also offer a bit of a nuance uh, to one of these, which is you know, zero day vulnerabilities are of course extraordinarily concerning and, and really imply the need to again, focus on adopting zero trust principles, limiting what an adversary can do if they gain access. But across the board, we are still seeing many intrusions uh, utilizing known vulnerabilities. Uh, so you know, not even zero day vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that have been known for months or years. And this is not specific to any sector really across the board. Uh, at CISA, we recently launched a catalog of known exploited vulnerabilities, uh, which is a list of about 330 or so vulnerabilities where we and our partners have seen adversaries using the vulnerability in the wild to exploit organizations. And so any entity should make sure that all of those vulnerabilities are, are patched and mitigated as a top priority of their cybersecurity program. Just to share with you both the polling results as they stand right now, 15% of the audience is going with number one, employees sharing data appropriately or leaking it deliberately. 26% um, is going for number two. Those are the zero day vulnerabilities. Uh, no surprise here, based on what you just said, Eric, almost half of the audience says that phishing and spear phishing are the number one threat they face. And uh, option number four, uh, which was employees communicating outside of monitored networks, is um, is only registering with 10%. Um, Brian, how about you? Could you rank order starting with number one, what you think of as the biggest risks to cybersecurity? Yeah, Eric, I'll take a little bit of poetic liberty if that's okay with you outside of sure. the standardized four questions. But I mean, when you look at the data, right, the financial sector has seen about a 65% increase in magnitude attacks against it in the last five years. It remains an incredibly highly tempting target to commit financial crime or threat, social destabilization from a prolonged service outage. You know, the financial industry specifically is very vulnerable to upstream disruptions through third-party services and third-party applications. It's obviously dependent on power and connectivity and communications. All of those things speak to supply chain. But when you put into the factor ransomware groups, right, ransomware actors have target the financial sector during the M&A process 
to destabilize mergers and acquisitions having a direct impact on the financial sector. You know, SIM swapping remains a concern. New mobile malware variants remain a concern. Specific to COVID-19, our data says that 97% of banks had to accelerate telework adoption practices and mobile um, activity on laptops, phones because of COVID and not understanding third-party services and apps and remote work and telework capabilities is yet another vector of exposure. But I think the message I would leave all of you with in terms of financial sector is the one about supply chain governance and visibility. You have to know who your supply chain providers are. You have to know who the third-party services and app providers are. You have to know what normal operational traffic for your network looks like. So those are just some additional thoughts I would add in addition to what Eric Goldstein mentioned. Uh, Brian, examples just like paintings, uh, you know, speak a thousand words. Could you pick perhaps one or two uh, hacks, cybersecurity breaches that you're intimately familiar with and use them to illustrate some of these points that you're making and perhaps even the ones that Eric has made as well? Sure, I'll, I'll stick with the one that we all know about, which is Solar Winds from about a year ago. I mean, Solar Winds is your traditional software as a service, third-party vendor vulnerability. You know, at the end of the day, it could have affected eighteen thousand businesses, right? From one compromise, force multiplied out, is eighteen thousand businesses. Um, you know, the U.S. financial sector must understand that third-party services, third-party applications through trusted partner relationships. Um, you know, NIST has specifically provided guidance about what companies and organizations should look for in terms of third-party services and apps and supply chain vulnerabilities. So that would be the one I would stick with, Eric, just because it's so well known and the potential impact to so many corporations and organizations could have been so vast. Eric, is there an example that you'd cite that you think is illustrative that has some lessons we ought to learn from? You know, one example that I'll cite, Eric, which is really a, a vulnerability uh, uh, more than an incident, but of course the recent work that the cybersecurity uh, community did around the Log4j uh, software vulnerability, which really, uh, you know, for those who, who may not be aware, uh, Log4j is an extremely widely used uh, software library uh, used in millions of devices and products around the world. In early December, uh, the cybersecurity community identified, uh, uh, identified an easily exploitable vulnerability in the software library uh, that could have enabled adversary exploitation of countless devices and products around the world. And what we saw is a real call to action uh, by network defenders, uh, not only in this country, but really globally uh, to rapidly understand exposure and deploy protections. But I think one of the lessons learned uh, from this work is the criticality of understanding the software and hardware running on the network, um, and then actually what's included in that software that really is foundational table stakes to any effective cybersecurity program, but it's actually also one of the most challenging things to do for a complex, large organization, particularly one that's running a lot of legacy infrastructure. At CISA, we're putting a lot of effort into driving adoption of software bill of materials, which, which are processes to understand not just what software you're running on your network, but also what are the components of that software, which really expedites one's ability to understand impact from a vulnerability and the prioritize remediation. And so I think this was an effort where uh, we saw great efforts from the cybersecurity community. We have not yet seen the sort of prevalent damaging intrusions uh, that we were so concerned about, although certainly we know that adversaries remain focused on this vulnerability and certainly any organization operating software with the vulnerability should take steps to mitigate with great urgency. Uh, gentlemen, your comments thus far have prompted a couple of questions which I'm going to introduce into the conversation. Uh, the first one has to do with, with what you just said, Brian, so I'll pose this question to you, and if, Eric, you want to jump in afterward with anything, feel free. What is stopping regulation from forcing critical industries such as financial services not to use third-party software that hasn't been properly, for lack of a better term, vetted? Now, the question as to who does the vetting is something we'll leave aside for a moment, but it's a valid question. Why is everybody free to use whatever, regardless of how risky it may be, 
is there not something that the quote unquote government could do in the way of legislation or regulation to help in that regard? Hey, Eric, I'm going to let Eric Goldstein uh, respond to that question because that's squarely within CIS's mission space. Certainly, thanks, Brian. You know, I think the, the important takeaway here is that every organization needs a strong third-party risk management program that is grounded both in, in um, the right security principles and then implemented in a prioritized way so that third parties and vendors with those key trust relationships that could be abused by an adversary are subject to the utmost scrutiny and those connections are tightly monitored and tightly managed and the organizations work uh, works through those scenarios where what do they do if a trust relationship is abused how do they limit the blast radius uh, the impact that an adversary could have if they are able to move from a vendor or supplier network onto the company's enterprise network uh, certainly financial institutions uh, driven in part uh, by regulation uh, have adopted strong third-party risk management programs, but each of those programs needs to be discreetly tailored based upon the business of the organization, the way that they use third parties and suppliers and the relationship with those third parties and suppliers, which then will dictate the sort of controls and scrutiny that a given supplier should undertake. And, and I hope you'll both be encouraged by this question and I'll direct it to you first, Brian. Um, and this goes back to cooperation between the public and private sector and that 75 to 80 percent gap that you described in awareness of what's actually happening in the way of cybersecurity breaches. What types of information do you want us to share with the FBI and with CISA? Uh, be prescriptive. Sure. Um, there's a few standard reporting mechanisms into uh, the U.S. government, and, you know, we're proud to say that a call to one is a call to all, and that also includes any financial institutions out there that have an ongoing relationship with Secret Service as they're deeply invested in that sector as well. Um, but for the FBI, the primary reporting structure would be through your local field office or to www.ic3.gov, which stands for the Internet Crime Complaint Center. But bottom line, the more detail that can be provided and the more timely that information is provided, the better we will all be positioned to help. Um, that in Colonial Pipeline resulted in the seizure of millions of dollars of ransom paid. Now that is a difficult scenario to replicate, but it is possible at times. But information such as initial attack vector, when the compromise was originally found and located, whether your systems are segregated, is there impact on the IT and the OT or just the IT or just the OT? Is there a signature or indicator of compromise that would allow us to identify an actor or a nation state behind the attack? All these levels of detail would be very, very helpful for us. Another one in ransomware that's specifically helpful is, are there immediate backups available? that would allow all of you to forego paying the ransom. And so one of the things the FBI can do if we're asked is we'd be happy to share the data we have on the ransomware groups, right? And some of the data, and I can't go into great detail here, but some of that data is very, very powerful for corporations to know before they enter negotiations with a corporate, with a uh, ransomware gang. But bottom line, the more specific, the more timely, the better position we will collectively be. I would want Eric to have the opportunity to chime in because uh, they have parallel reporting. Uh, but again, for all those out there, a call to one is a call to all. So you don't have to report to the FBI and to CISA. A report to CISA or a report to the FBI, whoever you have a relationship with, and we'll share the information between us. Yep, that's exactly right, and, and would, would fully endorse uh, all of what Brian just outlined. I'll also call out a, a useful whole of government website here, uh, which is stopransomware.gov, uh, which is a website developed jointly uh, by CISA, the FBI, the Secret Service, other partners that provides the most up-to-date guidance on uh, how to detect, identify, mitigate, and recover from, rans from ransomware intrusions. And then also on this website outlines, as Brian noted, uh, the ways to report uh, both to the FBI and to CISA. Um, and as noted, you know, there is no need to report to both organizations unless somebody is, is inclined to, uh, but reports are shared seamlessly uh, between our two organizations. And so any entity, the most important thing is to report the incident. 
because once it's reported, uh, the U.S. government can offer help to the victim. But even if the victim doesn't want help, even if the victim has it covered internally or with a third party, we can then help figure out how to protect others and help to prevent the same actor, the same intrusion from happening again. And so really the encouraging point is, you know, whatever you report, CISA or the FBI, just report so we can help others. And could we just... Uh... Would you mind each repeating the websites that you just described? I'm not able to put them up on the screen for people, and so I just think it would be good if you repeated them. Eric, you just mentioned one, and then Brian, I think you mentioned two. Certainly. So the, the website I mentioned is stopransomware.gov, uh, which is a whole of government website uh, to learn about how to prevent ransomware and also report incidents. Of course, uh, viewers can also go to cisa.gov, uh, which has our broader information and how to report to CISA there as well. And for us in the FBI, Eric, it's uh, www.ic3.com. So ic3.com, but we would, dot .gov, I'm sorry, ic3.gov. Um, but I would say, listen, the FBI for over 100 years has been built on personal relationships. And while the reporting mechanism is available and should be used, we also would really encourage institutions out there to build a relationship with their local field office, FBI field office, cyber squad today, because that personal contact, having someone's cell phone in your back pocket is, is perhaps more valuable in the moment. Can I ask you both a question about timeliness? Maybe I'll direct it to you first, Brian. Um, you know, I, I think it's obvious to everybody that information decays in value over time. I'd like you first, how quickly do you find companies reporting, those companies that do report cyber intrusions, how quickly do they tend to report them? Because I know, you know, thinking organizationally, there are a lot of traps that companies have to run once they realize that they've been breached. And how quickly do you want them to respond? How quickly should the CTO or the chief information security officer, perhaps even the general counsel, um, pick up the phone and call the FBI or call CISA? Yeah, so your question absolutely underscores what I think from the FBI's perspective would be my primary takeaway for the audience, which is build those relationships now with CISA, with the FBI, develop an incident response plan and exercise it. The numbers, the people's names in that incident response plan have to be personally known to all the personnel in the financial institution where you work. Um, but timeliness matters in all crimes. Uh, we can provide data on business email compromise and the financial fraud kill chain, on child abductions, on any number of other crimes. Time matters. It really matters. And the bottom line is this. The faster organizations report to us, the better position the U.S. government will be to potentially help. I say potentially help because at times, just in full transparency, there is nothing that we can do to aid the victim in a better way than they're being aided by their third party incident response firm. But we can absolutely help other future victims from being victimized. And we may be able to serve as an action arm, either unilaterally within the FBI or as an enabler with US Cyber Command or other partners of ours to bring pain to the adversary as a result of the victim sharing with us in the moment. But again, that starts through planning today. Okay. Um, Eric, I want to direct something to you. We've called this panel Securing Wall Street from Cyber Risks, but to be clear, Wall Street is a writ large con uh, sort of concept. It doesn't just encompass the securities industry. It extends to commercial and consumer banking, asset management, alternatives, insurance, payments, and increasingly crypto as well. Anywhere I like to think money is on deposit, in transit, or being invested. Now, collectively, the companies in these businesses spend billions of dollars every year on cybersecurity, but we don't know how effective that spending is. This is your area of expertise, I like to think. How secure is financial services as an industry relative to, say, something else we might think of as vulnerable to a cyber intrusion or attack, like the energy industry or public infrastructure? The financial sector has made extraordinary investments over the years in cybersecurity. Uh, some of the best uh, leaders and experts in the world uh, call the sector their home. Uh, and certainly the sector has pioneered uh, both novel technologies for cybersecurity, but also collaborative models, uh, including uh, the FSISAC that I 
that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so certainly the financial sector is on the leading edge uh, of our nation's critical infrastructure in deploying the right cybersecurity controls uh, to meet their mission needs. Now, it bears noting, as, as my colleague Brian explained, uh, that we are, of course, aware that certain adversaries do seek to target uh, the financial sector, uh, which means that institutions uh, need to continue evaluating and testing their controls in light of what we understand our adversaries to be doing and planning and developing. And of course, there is inevitably some degree of asymmetry between institutions in the financial sector, which is why it is so important uh, for CISA and our colleagues to work not only with the largest uh, entities, but also smaller and regional organizations, um, providers of financial infrastructure, and even dependencies across sectors to ensure that, that we are maintaining the integrity of the financial system for all of the different participants. Uh, Eric, as you noted uh, in your question, at CISA, we spend a large amount of time focusing on understanding dependencies and interdependencies within and across sectors so we can do just that work. So even if we assume that the most sophisticated entities in a given sector have the right controls, have mature security programs against known and emerging threats, we also understand where there may be dependencies that require further support and further assistance to avoid introducing vulnerabilities into the broader ecosystem. Could you comment further on the asymmetry issue? We know, for example, that money center banks, global banks such as JP Morgan spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on cybersecurity. Does that make the money and data housed inside a bank like that safer than say the money and data stored at a retail you know, trading platform like Robinhood Markets? So certainly when assessing uh, the, the both maturity and effectiveness of a given security program, it's, it's important to understand, first of all, investment, because investment in the right security controls that are tailored to a given risk environment uh, should uh, uh, inherently lead to better security. But of course, one also has to look at the adversaries uh, that are targeting a given institution um, and also the dependencies that a given entity has. And so our goal at CISA is, is to ensure that every organization makes the right investments for its risk environment and its risk profile. And so an organization that is being targeted more frequently uh, by advanced actors uh, may need a different kind of security program uh, or different de degree of defenses uh, versus one that isn't. Uh, but certainly there is nothing that inherently makes a smaller organization more at risk than a larger organization. The key is for both to, invest it, to have invested in a security program that is tailored to meet the risk they're facing. I'd like to bring our audience back in for the second poll, gentlemen. Folks, here's the question. Please pay attention to your screens. Uh, what best describes your data security capabilities? Option number one, we can detect and block data leakage in real time. Option number two, we're able to detect data leakage after the fact. Option number three, we're not always certain when data leakage has occurred. Uh, gentlemen, we'll let the uh, audience have a few moments to submit their answers to that question and we'll come back to it in a moment. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to pose this to you both. Uh, the what keeps you up at night question is an old interview trope, but in this case, we really do want to know the answer because you both know the bad actors and you know what they're capable of doing better than anybody else. So Brian, what keeps you up at night? Uh, Eric, I'll give you one kind of in the moment and then one forecasting the future. In the moment is what we don't know about. Um, whether that's a zero day vulnerability, whether that is a vulnerability that's being exploited at scale that we don't know about, whether there's new malware being deployed by a state actor that has new signatures that we can't tie together at the enterprise level. These are things that all impact our ability for resiliency and net defense here in the United States, but also hamper our investigative ability or the action arms in the US government to help with the net defense or help on the offensive side. So those are the things that concern me on a daily basis, which is again, um, you know, let me just say this, 
whatever figure you want to throw out there, 90% plus, these threats are seen by our private sector partners, and that collaboration between all of us is super important. The over the horizon, the forward looking one is about synthetic content, what we call publicly deep fakes, but within the US government and in academia, what's largely referred to as synthetic content. When you look at biometric authentication, facial recognition, digital footprints, mimicking voices, these things are huge, huge challenges to the law enforcement, the intelligence community in the next five to 10 years, huge challenges for the private sector, multi-factor authentication, um, even risks to our democracy um, in terms of disinformation and malign foreign influence. And so from an over the horizon perspective, the synthetic content piece is something that is a fascinating discussion, uh, but also a very, very scary discussion. Eric, just before I get into what keeps you up at night, I want to share with you both the answers to our second polling question. It was about data security capabilities. 38% uh, of the audience believes it can detect and block data leakage in real time. 21% says it's able to detect leakage, but only after the fact. And 39% says, candidly, it's not always certain when data leakage has occurred. Now, Eric, as I said, what keeps you up at night? We heard from Brian. You know, I'll also offer two. Uh, the first is we have not yet seen in this country a cyber intrusion that directly results in a prolonged um, uh, degradation of essential services upon which Americans depend. And that really is, you know, at CISA, and I know our partners as well, you know, why we come to work every day to ensure that these services at CISA, we call them national critical functions, uh, remain viable under all conditions. Um, and what that means is, of course, for every organization to focus not only on security, but also resilience uh, to really test out, you know, what would happen if there's an intrusion of both the IT and the operational technology or OT network and how the organization can keep those essential services running under all conditions. You know, it's, it, 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 of course, bears noting, as all of us know, that network technologies now underpin every facet of our lives and the ability of malicious cyber actors to, to degrade those services um, is, is deeply concerning and merits, again, this ongoing focus um, uh, on resilience. Um, the longer term point I'll raise is the fact that even as we are urgently investing in cybersecurity controls to protect today's technology, organizations, particularly in the financial sector, are of course also continuously innovating to provide uh, more productive, efficient, scalable tooling to their customers and their organizations. That of course means that we have to secure those new technologies, but simultaneously, we have to focus on securing our legacy infrastructure um, that of course is foundational to so many organizations. And so simultaneously making sure that new technology uh, is developed with security by design and top of mind while making investments uh, ongoingly in securing legacy infrastructure um, also I think is an area that, that requires focused investment going forward. Gentlemen, I'm mindful of both your time, so I'm going to jump to the third polling question so that we have an opportunity to get it in for our audience. Again, folks, please pay attention to your screens. Here's the question. How have you adapted to hybrid work environments or work from home situations? Option number one, we don't restrict communication on personal channels outside our network. Option number two, we monitor employees use of personal communication channels. Option number three, we don't allow employees to use personal communication channels for work purposes. I suspect, gentlemen, you'll be interested in the answer to this poll. Uh, there is an obvious follow-up question, and I'm going to pose it to you, Eric, which is how closely should the financial services industry monitor its own employees, both at work and at home? You know, I think the... The main key here is to have, and, and Celine Bryan should weigh in here as well, you know, have a focused insider threat program uh, that, that understands the potential impacts of an insider threat for different roles, for different positions, for different accesses, and then take steps to appropriately detect and mitigate risks of insider threats as they emerge. Uh, part of an insider threat program certainly can involve 
uh, monitoring of communications, uh, but it also certainly is not a silver bullet. And so the key that I would offer is to have a holistic insider threat program that has uh, layered mitigations and variables brought in to, to detect an emergent threat before it causes harm to the organization. Uh, Brian, I'll just share the poll results that I have at the moment. Uh, somewhat shockingly, 56% of respondents um, don't restrict communications on personal channels outside their networks. That was option number one. Uh, and option number two, uh, we monitor employee use of communications channels, personal communications channels, was affirmative for 43% of our respondents. From a law enforcement standpoint, do you favor, um, I guess, deep or extensive monitoring of employee communications, Brian? You know, Eric, that's a tough question to answer. Um, you know, we certainly have rigorous protocols inside the organization in terms of what we can and cannot share outside of the organization, what we can and cannot do on devices. You know, I think Eric offered a really good answer about understanding, and I'll get his I think I'll get his terminology right, understanding the multiple variables that are going to play into the analysis about whether someone is posing a threat to your brand or more, more significantly to the bottom dollar, the profit of your organization and taking a multi-step process through layered defenses on that is probably really good advice. Eric, you mentioned earlier third party risk management and I wanted to raise a question for you on that subject, specifically as it concerns security ratings. There are a number of companies out there selling expensive subscriptions that grade service providers on their cybersecurity. But what I've also learned is that in many cases to get a good grade, the suppliers themselves also have to buy subscriptions from these same rating companies, often at even higher prices. And that reminds me of the credit rating model that landed us in the financial crisis when issuers paid Moody's or Standard & Poor's for AAA ratings. What guidance would you offer on these cybersecurity ratings, these third-party risk management companies, and the way these ratings are compiled. You know, as a, as a first principle, it is extraordinarily important for any organization to ongoingly assess, measure, and where possible quantify their security posture and their security maturity. Uh, security rating services can provide a valuable input uh, into that sort of broader uh, measurement and quantification re regime um, you know, without commenting on the business practices of individual uh, ratings organizations, certainly the ability to get a recurringly updated third party assessment of, of an organization's risk profile and security baseline is important to understanding changes in posture and the need for further investment. Now, rating services uh, that, that often look at an organization's internet exposed assets can be one input, but of course there are others like penetration tests, uh, like red teams and purple teams uh, that are also invaluable to help an organization understand once an adversary can get into the organization, what can they do and what can they access? And those sort of assessments can also be invaluable in closing down holes and giving management and the board uh, a critical perspective on security risks and gaps therein. Gentlemen, I suspect it won't surprise either of you to learn that there's one topic more people seem to be more interested in than anything else, and that's crypto and blockchain. So I'm going to begin with crypto. Uh, Brian, where does crypto currently fit into the cybercrime picture? Sketch it for us, and then I have a quick follow-up question. Well, in terms of a sketch, um, I'll probably say a little bit more simple than that along my six-year-old's artistic framework and say it's the only game in town, right? Um, Crypto is the primary currency and the primary vehicle to facilitate extortion payments, um, data leakage extortion payments, et cetera. So it's the only game in town. We all know that the blockchain offers us some opportunities, but largely the ability to pay crypto scripted immediately into a tumbler, whether through an extortion payment or theft, is a huge, huge challenge for us. The FBI and the Department of Justice have had some successes, however. Are there any lessons we should draw from the recent crocodile of Wall Street bust? 
Um, you know, I think that the most important thing, two things. Number one is early engagement with us does enhance our collective ability to recover or to track cryptocurrency. On the case that you just mentioned, I think the most important takeaway is just the stick to the grit of the people working in the U.S. government to solve these thefts, to solve these crimes short and long term after the crime actually commits. And I think, quite frankly, the example that you brought is quite commendable in terms of what happened. Uh, and one quick one before I pivot to you, Eric, um, a lot of people, as you might imagine, are interested in sort of a how-to when it comes to ransomware attacks, and we're not going to get into details there, but a relevant question uh, concerns ransomware insurance because there are really three ways of managing risk, right? One is that you lay it off on somebody else. Um, the third is that you manage it yourself. And the fourth is, of course, that you just buy, you know, you buy insurance. Um, is ransomware insurance a good idea? It's, it, and this is a question straight from the audience. Yeah, Eric, I'm not in a position to uh, comment on that publicly. Certainly, uh, we can talk about that offline in a more private setting. I would just bring us back to the focus point of the more money that we pass to criminal enterprises, the stronger they do get, the more creative they get, the more professional they get. And I'll give you two quick examples. Number one, we know that ransomware actors in Eurasia and Russia have literally established call centers between the ransomware groups to professionalize the ability to pay a ransom and then to have your files decrypted. And secondly, we know that they're shutting down ransomware groups or brands and simply transferring all of the victims to other ransomware gangs or groups or profiles so that those other groups that they're collaborating with uh, or in a conspiracy with in our terms um, can benefit and profit from them. The only way those organizations, those criminal organizations get that strong is by getting more and more money. And Eric, the other side of the coin, blockchain, you don't have to go far. I don't need to tell you, even inside a bank, right, to find evangelists for blockchain, te blockchain technology who say, who tell us maybe with good reason that it's going to revolutionize finance, it's going to eliminate friction, it's going to improve trust, and it's good going to add layers of impenetrable security that are built into the algorithms themselves. What's your view on blockchain as a tool for the purposes of cyber protection or managing cyber risk? Yeah. You know, certainly blockchain has intriguing use cases, uh, both for uh, you know, novel services uh, as well as potentially uh, for security. Uh, the key, of course, as with any new technology, will not be only how it's designed, you know, how, how secure is the cryptography, but also how is it configured? How is it implemented? How is it integrated with other systems and platforms? And so much of what we see in security where risks arise is not actually that a given piece of software or, or hardware was designed poorly, but it, that it was either configured poorly or it was integrated poorly as part of a broader ecosystem. And so as we think about integrating uh, blockchain into various aspects of the financial system, uh, either within a given institution or as we look forward into the future, perhaps more generally, the key will be ensuring not only that these systems are secure by design, but that they are integrated securely so that we are not introducing new risks even as we innovate. Gentlemen, I have to wrap up and I want to ask you this question. The bad actors, the adversaries whom you're up against have a couple of advantages on their side. They can mobilize, perhaps by force, if necessary, the best hackers in the world, and they can take whatever time they want to break in and infiltrate a victim's network. Eric, you returned to public service from a very high profile job in the private sector. Are enough of the best people making the choice that you made foregoing the financial incentives available to them on Wall Street or in Silicon Valley to dedicate their careers to cyber defense in the public sector? In other words, is this a fair fight? I think it is. And I think we have an extraordinarily talented group of professionals, of cybersecurity experts, not just at CISA, but at the FBI and across the broader U.S. government. Uh, we, of course, always need more. What I will say, having recently rejoined government uh, from the private sector, there is no better mission in the world than coming to work every day and being focused on protecting the American people against the threats that we know are confronting us. Um, and of course, I would encourage 
any individual who is seeking to move into the field or looking for a new role to consider public service. There is really nothing more rewarding. Uh, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that anybody can visit uh, CISA.gov uh, to learn about options at, at our agency. And I'll also note in closing here that you know, the historical model where somebody would join government service and work in it for decades and then retire. We know that doesn't work, uh, certainly in the cybersecurity field um, and certainly with the new generation of professionals. And so the model we are seeking is that somebody joins public service for a few years, does terrific work, helps safeguard our country, perhaps goes back out to the private sector, learns some new skills, does some great work there, and then comes back in. Um, that is the only way that we will attract the talent uh, that we need to meet the mission confronting us. And certainly we are looking for talent wherever it may be in this country to help us join us uh, in this mission. And Brian, very quickly and last to you, we're all aware of how consequential the information gaps and misaligned priorities were back on 9-11. When it comes to cybersecurity, how does our patchwork of federal agencies with varying degrees of responsibility know that it's doing all the right things and in the right order. Sure. You know, the Cyber Solarium Commission um, really took a look at this exact question and many others, and it's the uh, catalyst for the Senate confirmed position that we know as the National Cyber Director, who's uh, Chris Inglis. And so Chris's charter, one of Chris's charters, is to bring the operational components together a com across common fabric in a synthesized, synergistic way what I can tell you from sitting in my seat every day is that we are getting better by the day. That includes CISA, it includes us, it includes Treasury, State, U.S. Secret Service, NSA, Cyber Command, and others, not to mention the global partners who we're in touch with every day. Certainly, our goal is to begin with the end in mind. And what that means in real-time practice is what can all of us do today when we have intelligence or evidence inclusive of with the private sector to have an even bigger impact on our adversary or an even bigger impact on net defense. I'm very, very confident saying that we are getting better by the day and I think we'll be much better in the next year and the next two years. Brian Vordren, uh, Assistant Director of the FBI Cyber Division, Eric Goldstein, the Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at CISA. Gentlemen, thank you for being so generous with your time. And I'll speak on behalf of all the taxpayers in our audience. Thank you for the work that you're doing for the nation. Thank you.